I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Today, uh, for the first time, I will be giving a research update of how I investigate uh, wondrous wisdom. But uh, because it is the very first time, I will give an overview of uh, what I mean by wondrous wisdom. That'll take some time uh, just to give a summary. Uh, that we can all refer to uh, as I give uh, future updates on uh, this research. Uh, and uh, just to start out, because this is so important in my life, I just want to pray to God and ask God to touch you and uh, touch me and that we can connect somehow uh, and that we can connect on the level of the Spirit and appreciate what that means. So. Uh, what is wondrous wisdom? It's uh, what I am trying to uh, make real through Math for Wisdom. Uh, math for Wisdom relates the language of wisdom, uh, the language of cognitive frameworks, uh, basically the language of wondrous wisdom, with the language of advanced mathematics, which uh, mathematicians are familiar with, uh, in order to... Um, validate the wisdom, uh, maybe to uh, find, uh, clarify the wisdom, but also to inform mathematics uh, and other sciences, so that it's a two-way street. Um, wondrous wisdom, the name wondrous is basically because my name is Andres, that rhymes with wondrous, so uh, that's a maybe like a brand name. Um, we could talk about my philosophy, uh, but the goal is not for me to have a philosophy. The goal is to have a uh, community, a scientific community, which has uh, speaks a shared language, um, has uh, investigations that various people lead and support uh, each other regarding. Every um, great uh, philosopher has their own private language. Um, and so the ones who are truly great are able to get other people to be interested to speak their private language, whether you're Aristotle or Plato or Kant uh, or Jesus or Buddha. But um, the issue is that um, Philosophy is a failed uh, discipline in a failed science uh, in that nobody's able to agree on anything, you know, after thousands of years. Uh, that's at least my feeling. So if we want to, uh, look, what my goal since childhood is, is to know everything and apply that knowledge usefully. Uh, so in pursuing that, I appreciated more and more that uh, wisdom is the key to knowledge and wisdom is the knowledge available to us. You know, we are instruments uh, for developing and uh, applying wisdom. So wisdom is the place, the discipline where, uh, which, where those answers could be available, but no one wants to look there, you know, because it's a, it involves a lot of responsibility. You know, once you ask, start asking big questions in a way of wanting big answers, you know, you push up against uh, godly issues. Uh, and also, of course, uh, if you want to know everything, it's very natural that uh, God's vantage point is uh, something to think about, uh, whether or not there is a God. Uh, it's certainly uh, the possibility of God, uh, however contradictory that could be, but simply any possibility of God uh, is helpful um, uh, in terms of trying to appreciate uh, what a knowledge of everything is all about. So, Wondrous wisdom, you can think of it as a way of saying, well, that's just Andrus's philosophy, but with this hope that it shouldn't be and it won't be. Uh, but for now, it's a private language. So this will be an overview of that private language. And if part of it or some of it can make sense of you, then we have a chance of, uh, of uh, succeeding. The goal being, and this relates to, you know, what do how do we apply knowledge of everything? Uh, well, through a shared culture. 
you know, maybe what Jesus talks about as the kingdom of heaven, uh, but this culture where we can work together on godly things. Um, but I, I really appreciate science uh, as a culture, uh, certainly um, on specific problems, it's just fantastic. Uh, it runs up into limitations in the big questions in life. So part of what this will be about is to show that a study of cognitive frameworks uh, could be done scientifically and really would expand the opportunities for science and help it connect uh, with uh, big questions. So in this uh, presentation, first I'll give some preliminaries. What are the bottom up types of things that you should know about the cognitive frameworks or the conceptual structures that I just have 40 years of uh, practice with. I'm uh, 58 years old. I started, uh, I, I, I set off on this quest. I was a six year old child. You know, I went to God. I said, you give me please, you know, the, the freedom to think um, whatever I need to, maybe you exist, maybe you don't, maybe you're good, maybe you're bad, but I will always believe in you. You see, I kind of sold my soul to God. <laughs> and so the idea is, but so that I would be free to go on this quest, okay? And so for all of my childhood, I was an independent learner um, and uh, just supremely ambitious and uh, maybe even aggressive, <laughs> you know, in terms of learning. Then I, at 17 years old, I went to University of Chicago and uh, they would ask the big questions. This was 1982, you could imagine. So they would ask the big questions, but you weren't allowed to come up with answers. And I thought, well, I want um, to know everything. I need to find absolute truth. You know, is there anything that we could know anything about? Is there, you know, what could we know anything about? And the answer there was no, you know, that you, you know, you can't, all knowledge is relative and so on. So that was a huge uh, hurdle um, I just faced up with and I just had to work independently. It's very interesting uh, that nowadays, uh, so much time has gone by, it's 40 years later, uh, I'm, uh, I just wrote a letter to a um, discussion group on uh, st structural equation modeling. And there, uh, Judea Pearl is uh, a um, world uh, expert on uh, causal inference. So he's he's written this interesting book of why uh, that I'm reading. But um, so he's saying that there's been this causal revolution that like 40 years ago, you weren't allowed to talk about their existing causes. Also, you weren't allowed to say that, you know, consciousness could be studied uh, scientifically. I personally knew Joseph Gogin. I, he was the editor of the Journal of Consciousness Studies. That, I don't think, I think that's started up in the 80s. You see, so issues of causation, issues of uh, consciousness, uh, what else? Uh, uh, there's different subjects that um, simply we can talk about now, but we couldn't do when I was a grad, you know, as a student. Uh, there weren't academic journals for that. There wasn't certainly about wisdom. Now, maybe a little bit, but like wisdom was not something that you could scientifically study. Even today, I don't think that there's a real serious study of wisdom. They can't tell you what is wisdom. Um, but I will today. And so... Um, I'll start with those preliminaries, then I'll give you an overview, and it's helpful for me to write this out, but basically it's very much about the relationship between God and human. And so uh, when I look at all those cognitive frameworks that I've been collecting documents, and I kind of see like, what are they all about? What's the purpose of this, et cetera, and kind of intuit it in terms of also, you know, expand upon my own insights into life. Uh, also having a life where I've had a lot of experience uh, organizing independent thinkers, uh, helping or reaching out to uh, people who are marginalized uh, in different situations. So I have some wisdom in my life. Uh, the basic wisdom being that God doesn't have to be good. You know, life isn't fair. Um, and so what are the implications of that? But, um, and what is that all about? Um, so I'll define, you know, God and human um, in some sense, and then I will give the big picture of the, the four questions that God is uh, investigating, uh, including through us, and then the four questions that we as human beings investigate, certainly I do, but hopefully not just me. Uh, I will pass through uh, four eightfold frameworks, um, 
for humans' uh, needs, doubts, uh, expectations, and values, uh, uh, how uh, we um, can model our intuition uh, that goes beyond us. So that's how we um, grapple with our questions in life. And I will uh, also uh, pass through uh, 24 fold sciences. So there's four sciences um, for God, for everything, for um, wishes, and for uh, love uh, that uh, show how God or a God like vantage point. Um, looks at God himself or herself and uh, looks at, let's say, what I experience, uh, looks at, let's say, somebody who would be like a you and somebody who would be like an other, you know, second and third person points of view. So that's the summary of uh, what it's about and uh, trying to work out this mechanics because it's certainly a work in progress, uh, lots to fill in. Um, but uh, these eightfold frameworks should connect with eightfold 24 fold sciences. And in particular, uh, one that I'm very much focused on now is wisdom. And you may have seen some uh, videos about the counter questions. So that relates to wisdom and how that would um, map to modeling the 24 fold experience of a first person like me, you know, like my experience in life. Like if I model my life, what would that look like? So from, let's say, a godly vantage point. How, so how does that fit with wisdom? Um, that's the big question. So in this research update, this is January 17th, 2023. The question I'm working on is how to relate wisdom and everything. And then I'll uh, explain how I work on that by modeling my meaningful experiences. And finally, I'll show the progress I'm making in trying to think through, establish a science of everything. We'll say what everything means, but it's everything has a structure. So why don't we start with everything? That's the pre preliminaries. So uh, and this was, you can think of me as 17, 18 years old. Um, but basically, uh, I wanted to work with absolutes. And so the anchor that I kind of, uh, was able to find um, was this concept of everything. Uh, and we'll see why in a minute. But um, basically, it's a fantastic concept in the sense that it has four properties. But all these properties apply to everything. So one property is that uh, there's, it has no external context, which means like if you put everything in a box, it includes the box. If I think of everything, it includes me. You know, if there's a God, but God's part of everything. So um, it has, um, it's the simplest algorithm. It accepts all things. There's no filter. So like whatever I think of, I put into everything. I can think of this notebook and I can think of the pencil and I can think of the chandelier and I think can think of me and I think of you and we all go into this everything. And so I could be a poet or I could be a president, um, but it is the same everything because it's just basically no filter, you know. Uh, and um, what that implies, it implies that um, we uh, we can, let's see, um, well, we can call this everything um, however we like, you know, like, uh, you can call it um, uh, love, you know, you can call it being, you can call it God, you could call it um, the essence, you know, the cosmos, whatever you want to call it. But but if it's this, it has a basic algorithm to it, then it's the same. We're talking about the same thing. Okay, so you can give it whatever name you want. Um, then uh, another property is that it has no internal structure. So it can be chaotic, it can be orderly, it's the same, everything, it doesn't care. And so one of the things uh, that follow from that is that like all things are true of everything. Uh, so you could say everything is hot, you could say everything is cold, everything is good, everything is bad. It's all relative with regard to everything because if it doesn't have any structure, it doesn't have any way to divide it, there's just no way to sort anything out based on everything. It's happy to take it all. So it has no internal structure. And then um, uh, it's a required concept. So like 
you have this concept of everything and I have this concept of everything. Now, you could maybe say, oh, there's somebody who lives in Australia, an indigenous person, and they don't have any concept of everything. And But first of all, like, even if you took a stand like that, you see, your stand is with regard to everything. So even for you to make a claim like that, like, you know, you would have to apply, you would have to show that you know what everything is because you make these absolute claims. Or if you said that there isn't any concept of everything, that's also an absolute claim. Like, you know, so uh, those stands that we take are with regard to everything in some sense, in some way. So uh, that's, um, uh, and we all have this concept, but we couldn't have learned it because you see, there's no analog of everything in the real world. You know, the, the universe is, is bounded. It's the known universe, you see. We don't have a concept with unbounded things. <laughs> it's just not something we can know about. It must be already in us, okay? And that's It's that basic. It's understandable why, you know, it, it could have this kind of universal concept. So it's that kind of thing. Uh, what everything is not, um, everything is not like everything on the table because that's within a particular scope. So that's not the everything we're talking about here. Everything here is like has no scope, right? Has no external context. So if I think of it, I have to be part of it, you know, that type of thing. So this is the starting point. Um, now, what does that let me do? Let's me talk about uh, divisions of everything. So the mind can try to divide everything, you see. And you'll get these structures, or a lot of times it works the other way around. You know, you find a structure and you can see it's kind of like a division of everything. It's mirror, you know, that everything is like a mirror of the mind. And so we're dividing this uh, into parts. So one way to think about uh, everything is uh, global work workspace for the brain. You know, if you think of the brain as uh, it certainly has a model of the body, right? And that's been found uh, and verified scientifically. But I would presume it surely has a model of itself, right? A brain like ours has a model of itself. And uh, I think they call that the global workspace, right? There's the global workspace of the brain. So we can talk about that, but I think the brain can probably do that too. So imagine taking that workspace and just saying, we're going to divide it up into two parts, like free will and fate. Okay, so very common. And I noticed when I was 17 or 18, that you'd have these horrible arguments, you know, are you for free will and you for fate? It's like, well, first of all, like, why do I have to take sides? And second of all, um, that's very interesting that people could take sides, that they do take sides, because it shows that there's a framework where these two perspectives are happening. And really, there, in a certain sense, there aren't any other perspectives. So you have this choice between two things. And so you think about that, explore it, and see what's at heart is this structure whereby, on the one hand, opposites coexist, as in free will. But on the other hand, all things are the same as with fate. And so that is uh, crucial for questions of existence. So for me to ponder, you know, whether a chair exists, I need to be able to ask the question, you know, it's possible it could exist, it could not exist, you know. So that's an example of opposites coexisting. But also I need to be able to answer, like, if it exists, then it exists. If it doesn't exist, then it doesn't exist, you know, but it is the way it is, right? So all is the same. So um, that's um, um, that just shows that, for example, existence is not the most basic type of thing. It's very basic in the sense that it's the mind uh, has two perspectives. That's not a lot, but it needs two perspectives. That is more than one or zero. Um, so for uh, participation or for learning, you know, like there's a learning cycle, you need three perspectives. You need to take a stand like a hypothesis, you need to follow through, maybe do an experiment, then you need to reflect, you know, on the data that you get, and then you can go back to your hypothesis. So that's like a cycle. For knowledge, uh, there are four levels, uh, whether, what, how, why. Um, if I have a cup, um, I can think of it as a sensory information, that's what. But I can also think of it as a blueprint for causation and for utility, how do you use it, you know, where did it come from? You know, so that'd be how. Um, but I could also thought think in very uh, ideal ways that like, well, if I put it in a cupboard and nobody saw it, would it still be there? You know, like, well, it's kind of a weird question. But that's about weather, 
Okay, so when we talk about whether things are, you see, it's there's some things that, you know, what we see is on one level, but whether things are is equal level. But that weather is a very strange thing. It's not something we access directly. And another thing we don't access directly is total knowledge. So, for example, for me to know why there's that cup, I would have to be able to know, like, all the possible relationships that it has. So, like, how does it relate to China? How does it relate to um shapes how does it relate to coffee you know how does it relate to me uh that i would know everything about everything in order to be able to, have to say why well, and if i did have that knowledge then this godly knowledge then i wouldn't really need the cup because all the knowledge would be in my mind you see i could just get rid of the cup so um the and so also like you look at something like the yoneda lama you say oh that's very much about those types of relationships so then like so I can talk about this structure, no one will care. But the point of math for wisdom is they say, oh, the Yoneda dilemma is a knowledge switch, you know, between these, where you can see how these four levels are at work. I'm hoping that, you know, if I can show that and do that and make videos about that, then people will see, oh, these levels are real. Okay. So this you should know very well in order to do research in wondrous wisdom. Um, but there's um, another thing you need to think about, and it just shows like the difficulty of doing this at um there are the underlying divisions, but we don't access them directly. We can kind of posit that they exist. But what we conceive of, I used to call them representations, but maybe I'm avoiding that term because um, it means other things in math. Of course, that's where I got it from. I think of them, I call them conceptions. So there's four ways to that we conceive this structure. And of course, I'm talking from decades of experience, you know, and I could be wrong, maybe, but you'd see like the whole there would be a lot of implications if I were wrong about this. But go ahead, you know, so let's work together. But we already talked about one, free will and fate, um, which is on the why level, you know, like. Um, but another way to experience would be like outside and inside. So if I'm, uh, I can be outside this cup, right? And it also has an inside. Those are opposites coexisting. But now imagine like, my mind slipped into the cup and I became in the cup, right? And for cup, it was like falling into the universe. Like we're in the universe, but it doesn't really make sense to talk about outside the universe because that would be in a bigger universe, you know, but we're just in this universe, right? We'd still be in, uh, there wouldn't really be an out. So that says that outside uh, presumes inside, but not the other way around. And so, um, but what's interesting is you see this motion in the mind, like the mind goes easily from free will. Oh, I can do whatever I want with this cup, but then I break it. You see, and, well, that happened, you know, and that can't, there's no way going back, you know, or, oh, I can do whatever I want. It turns out I'm a robot, you know, and then it's like, oh, I can't go back. So free will very much easily can slip over to fate, but there's no natural way for the mind to kind of like uh, slide back. And so the same with outside inside theory and practice. Uh, if I have a um, machine, like I think of like a mill, you know, for carrots or something, right? In theory, I can, the machine is off and I can imagine going through the machine, but not going through the machine itself, right? So there's this theory. But if I turn the machine on and I'm going through the machine, you see then the machine and I are like complements. It's kind of like human experience. You know, like human experience is a complement to whatever we are going through in this experience. And so that I call practice. So this distinction between theory and practice, kind of like between uh, off and on, right? Uh, you can go from theory to practice, but it doesn't switch back. Um, that's how I experience life. So uh, similarly, like with same and different, um, two cups can be the same, but they also have to be different. For them to be the same, there's got to be two of them, right? But then you notice, oh, they're different. So if they're different, they're just different. So that's very curious, you see. So when sameness actually uh, presumes uh, opposites coexist, and difference actually presumes it's all the same. So you see now um, the problems with reflections, okay? Like that when the mind conceives of opposites coexist and all the same, it ends up with the possibility, like here, it kind of flips it around. It flips around the direction. You go from same to different. Okay, But really, the mind underlying is going from opposites coexist to all is the same. That's, of course, this is all, in a certain sense, introspection, uh, although it's certainly based on um, 
not my own mind, you know, but really more um, imagining other people's minds, imagining the works of philosophers, you know, and other great thinkers, uh, and seeing like the cognitive frameworks that they come up with, the structures that they organize things in terms of. Um, and this this just goes out through all the great philosophers. Everything I'm saying, you know, you can find in other philosophers. It's just the problem of how do we go beyond the private language? How do we unify all this? And one of the evidences, so, you know, there's different evidences for these, but one of the evidences for these is I'm, I see that the way I have done the frameworks, they, they kind of build upon each other. So like these four conceptions, well, it relates to whether, what, how, why. So I would say that, uh, you know, uh, same and different would be on the weather level. And then the theory and practice you experience on the what level, the sensory level, and then the how like blueprint level is relating outside inside and then the why level like this kind of total knowledge let's say that we maybe feel that we have about certain our lives in a certain sense like this is a free will and fate you know and it works uh, the other way around so like these four levels um they are levels of knowledge and uh they have two conceptions if you want to think about these levels you have to choose how are you going to think about it are you going to think of them from as questions, whether, what, how, why, or as answers, whether, how, what, why. And um, the deal is, is that uh, idealists like to think in terms of questions. So for them, why is the big question that's very important? How not that big, still important. What is kind of very basic, but like whether is something they would really like to say, whether it doesn't make sense, you know, whether it's just not really real in a certain sense. Whereas if you're a materialist, it's the opposite. Like the answer, you know, whether things are is like what you really all about. Then what would be a distance removed? And then how would be another distance removed? And like why things are, it just it's a non-scientific, uh, uh, non-material type of question, right? Like now it's starting to change. I mean, like, so Judea Pearl calls his, says the book of why. But like when I was in college, you know, the idea that biology would talk about why, that was a very um, blasphemy against the theory of evolution, right? Like the theory of evolution says there is no why, right? Um, okay. So, but you see here that there are two conceptions and, you know, uh, people tend to, so a lot of times, like when you see a cognitive framework, like someone like a Plato, he'll have true opinion and false opinion. I would say that's the knowledge of how and knowledge of what. Then you'll have wisdom, which is the connected knowledge of why. But in Plato's Republic, in the whole book, there's like one sentence that says, well, you know, this wisdom has an opposite called ignorance. So then I could draw that in. There's a way. But basically, like, he deals with three levels. Uh, um, uh, whereas, uh, like, Pierce... Oh, so Pierce, for example, talks about symbols, uh, icon, index, uh, symbol, three kinds of sign. So icon would be using the pictorial uh, image, like a picture of a cat to represent a cat. Uh, how would be uh, to use like an index, a pointer, like a dead mouse, as though there was a cat. And why would be on the symbolic level, like uh, to understand uh, that the letter C-A-T refer to cat would be so arbitrary like you'd have to know everything about everything but uh he's only got three levels so that's very understandable but really there should be a fourth level which would be the cat itself right that the cat is the weather and these are three ways of thinking about it um so if there if you find a framework it's got three levels but if it's about knowledge really then you can draw in pencil in the fourth one okay so so it's not always, you have to think what you're doing. Uh, and so here again, like uh, it turns out that uh, there's like, is there a middle way possible? Do you have to ask a question? You know, the answer could be some kind of mediation. And then uh, you can kind of see like the answer basically is no. I, that's what my conclusion is. But, and the reason is because you see uh, to link weather and weather uh, from an idealist materialist point of view is that there's no connection because you know the materialists are saying, I mean, the idealists are saying there is no weather, really. So there's no way to have like four links between those levels because they don't, um, because there's a base level in each side. There's a kind of like a null level. So I haven't, uh, 
So that's one thing, you know, so the evidence would be like, you know, what is the evidence in terms of, you know, how people think? And I haven't found anybody to really do a convincing job of showing that they think that kind of way. Can I think like some kind of third level? And I don't see how, you know, like I can't really be honest and say I can think that. Uh, but that honesty is extremely important. Like, can we honestly think uh, not uh, removed, like not look at our mind as, uh, you know, the contents of a table, but actually experiencing, you know, like, well, do I think? So a crucial skill there is to slow your mind down, right? To look, what are the directions I have available? Because as soon as you take steps and think ahead, you know, you've lost connection with the with the situation, the state of mind you're trying to describe. So maybe that takes training, you know, maybe I have that training, maybe maybe people should try to develop that training. Hope that's possible. So like I said, personal intuition, uh, the intuitions of other people, uh, as much as we can kind of relate to that. Um, but then kind of seeing like how the system uh, develops. Uh, so here uh, questions are kind of like a dual point of view and then answers are just answers. So this idea that questions like, when you ask a question, it's like opposites coexist. Uh, but when there's an answer, it's just uh, the way things are. So I think that that's an example of the two sums. So you can see how they kind of, the structures build on each other. Now, so how many representations of the threesome are there? And I say that there's four. So remember the threesome is this learning cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting. But um, uh, there's four levels of um, thinking about that uh, because you, know, you have to kind of conceive it. So there's four ways to conceive it. It's the same, whether, what, how, why. And actually, uh, we can see, um, and this is actually very important because uh, this, these four uh, conceptions of the threesome yield what I call 12 circumstances. I used to call them topologies, but you know, because I used to call them topologies because uh, um, you, um, in order to talk about them, you kind of have to, you can't really just define them. You have to kind of talk about a whole world. I'll show you how they come out from puzzles. So for example, uh, well, so if you saw the video on um, introduction to math for wisdom, uh, the one in the middle says constancy, you know, so search for constancy. So either you find one example of constancy or it's all constantly not constant. Okay. And to play this game, uh, you, um, you have this regularity where, uh, and that really, that's the regularity of the many that, uh, Anytime you select something to judge, and then you judge something, how do you know it's the same thing, right? There's this, uh, there's this regulator there. So that's a kind of constancy. So there's a constancy in the one that, you know, it's a, then there's a constancy because you were looking for constancy. So you found the constancy. That's, that's, a, that's a way to think about constancy. It's in the one or it's in the all, you know, in the sense that you never found um, anything that you wanted to find. You know, you found the constancy. So it's all constantly in constant. Or it's in this regularity, which is in the procedure by which you were doing this. So one all many. Um, another game would be like a um, subject object process. How do you define that? And so this is also very important for, it's another way to define things. Um, this is a way of defining things by playing a mind game. It's saying that uh, I can't talk about more primitive things, but I can say that you understand what I'm talking about because I can make you go through the same mental motions by playing this game, which we'll say is a mind game, this puzzle. So for example, uh, let's say we want to um, give attention, you know, let's, let's talk about attention and see, well, our attention can be uh, directed to something else, you know, beyond itself, right? Like a whistle. But at a certain point, like then our attention could be directed by itself. You know, that I heard a whistle, I heard a whistle, I heard a whistle, right? So it's actually not directed to the whistle anymore. It's directed to itself. Um, and then um, the the attention, um, well, there's like, there's like a subject in order to have this game. Like there's a subject that can choose, you know, like whether to pay attention to the, uh, well, who's directing the attention, basically, is able to direct the attention. So that's a very uh, slick way of defining object, process, and subject see from very minimal things. So you can see like these kinds of concepts that are important to us, they kind of like start to uh, find a way to define themselves. Another one would be a being, doing, and thinking. So this is kind of like Descartes. Um, 
Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. So like the way I would say it, it's regarding the concept of significance, which means, uh, and so you'll start to see like, uh, like remember these whether, what, how, why? Well, how would I define significance? I'd say, well, um, significance means it can't be encompassed. Okay, so like why is kind of like saying that you've encompassed everything, all the things it's related to, right? So if something's significant, it means, no, you can't encompass it, which speaks back to this thing of everything having no external uh, context, no box. So things are significant. So I'm significant if I can't be boxed, say, right? So to say, I think, therefore, I am uh, probably a more, um, the way to say it with regard to these cognitive frameworks is, I think, therefore, I am. If thinking is uh, significant, then being is significant. Like if you can't encompass all the things I think, like so all the things are thought, then you can't encompass the thinker, right? Who thinks all these things. And then, but if the if the thinker can't be encompassed, well, those thoughts are reflective like on all the things they do. So um now, let's see, do I have this direction right? I have to be honest with myself. <laughs> I have to double check. Let's see. I think, therefore, I am. Um, you know, maybe there's not the time for me to do this, but it's only honest, right? I think, therefore, I am. It means that, uh, yeah, I think if thinking is significant and being encompasses significance, then also being is okay. Oh, Okay, so I am, therefore, I do, right? So if being is, is significant, it can't be encompassed, then the things I do can't be encompassed either. That sounds backwards. I'm just wondering, hmm. No, if being can be a significant, okay, we're not going to, you're going to, we can talk about this later. And then the last one, like if, if I, I do, therefore, I think, right? Um, if doing is, I think, therefore, I am. I do, therefore, I think. Like, if if doing is significant, um, then thinking is significant. Like, if you can't encompass all the things that are done, right, then you can't encompass all the things that are thought about, that could be thought about them, right? Well, These things always need to be checked from the beginning. So then finally, um. So, you know, let's feel free to, you know, you both need to sleep on it. Then finally, um, true uh, in terms of um, when to talk about truth. Um, so maybe let's just go through these. Like these are all negations of the levels, whether, what, how, why. Uh, so constancy says there's no how, you know, there's no change, right? That's what constancy means. Uh, for things to be direct, okay, says that there's no what, okay, that there's no mediation, okay? And then for things to be, uh, so things like you're directing my attention, well, that means that uh, there's no mediation, I'm being yanked around, right? And then um, for things to be true, uh, that means that there's no weather. So they can't be hidden in the cupboard. So things that are true are like obvious in a certain sense, like that they can't, the definition of truth is like what cannot be hidden. Well, uh, so in the situation like you have something and then something that makes it viewable or shown, right? So you have like a, uh, a content, you have like a form. And so um, why would they be, you know, in what sense would they be true? Well, it could be necessarily true, like in a proof by contradiction, if what something is and what it uh, shows itself to be are the same thing. Okay, so that'd be necessarily true. Uh, it could be actually true, like in grounds and consequences that um, they're not the same thing, you know, so, but uh, that um, it's actually true. So like based on what it shows itself to be, like then it is, uh, you know, it, 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 and what it is, like it's obvious what it is based on what it shows itself to be, but it's a, not a one-step process, let's say. And then things are possibly true. Uh, so that'd be like self-consistency saying that, well, what is obvious is that connection. That's what we see. We see the connection. So it's consistent in that sense, you know, not having to make any claims about whether the 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 grounds or the consequences are true, but it's consistent, so it's possibly true. So the point being that uh, not only are these uh, four uh, conceptions of the threesome, and of course I'm claiming there's only four, but you start to see like why I would believe there's only four because 
it's connected to the idea that there's four levels of uh, knowledge, whether, what, how, why, right? These negations. It's also connected to the idea that uh, you could have a um, division of everything into one, which would be everything itself, but you could also have a division of everything into zero perspectives, okay? And that would be for issues of God. Uh, and so that would be like when the brain models its whole workspace, but without dividing it into two parts or one parts or three parts, but just no parts. Right? So it was kind of a strange thing, but you could imagine it modeling itself that way. And so uh, the properties of God can be read off here. Uh, these are the four representations of God. Be, you know, God is true, direct, constant, significant. Uh, so one of these uh, things that are very important about these particular um, and I call them 12 circumstances, is that these are the unities by which we imagine. These are like the backdrops of imagination. So when we want to think of a particular perspective, you know, these structures are explaining, I call them divisions of everything, but they're basically, uh, these cognitive frameworks are explaining how a set of perspectives can define each other by fitting together. Like you take a stand, you follow through and you reflect, and if, if someone, some other planet has that structure, then you you don't know which one is which, but you know that they're talking about the learning cycle. So when we see in mathematics the Jacobi identity, and then we think, hmm, what's the relationship between Lie algebra and Lie group? Well, the Lie algebra is on the tangent space, and in a certain sense, the tangent space is showing the learning of the group, how it works, uh, I presumably. Yeah. So, or if, uh, you know, so um, you can read these things in. So, when we want to, however, pop out or or focus on a particular perspective, then we need to uh, have a perspective on a perspective. And so either you can be associated with the perspective that is being reflected upon, and that would be these 12 circumstances. And Or you can do it the other way around, which would be like the perspective on the perspective. So those would be the six conceptions. Six conceptions, as we saw, some frameworks have... Um, or um, conceptions, as in this case, whether, what, how, why, uh, basically like knowledge of um, nothing, something, anything, everything. And those that's how I think of the conceptions. I would call them uh, scopes. So the scope of nothing, the scope of something, the scope of anything, the scope of everything. Or um, they would be um, the two conceptions, as in case of, um, let's say, the foursome or the five, some six, some seven, some, they have two perspectives. So like there was the questions and the answers. So questions would be, I could call it increasing slack, and then answers would be decreasing slack. Uh, and so increasing slack, decreasing slack are uh, two conceptions, and then uh, nothing, something, anything, everything are four conceptions. You get six conceptions. Uh, you have these 12, and those would let you think about the division as a whole. Okay, like, you know, we think of, they're holistic. But it's, again, a perspective on a perspective. You're kind of stepping out and saying, hmm, you know, how is this being thought of, right? And so that's how we need to think in order to look at it. Because otherwise, we're just directly immersed in them, then, then we're just living them. Um, so those are the building blocks, um, divisions, eight divisions, six conceptions, 12 circumstances. And their eight divisions, they fit into an eight cycle. So it's saying that when you, uh, when a human being or some maybe an orangutan or so um, uh, has an internal world, that internal world consists of eight cognitive frames, eight cognitive frameworks. And depending on the issue that a person is thinking, so for example, if a person is um, pondering matters of existence, uh, then it's the twosome. But if they're pondering matters of decision making, then it's the five sum. But if they add another uh, uh, perspective, it would be morality. So, for example, um, in math, you know, if you probably have maybe aware that I've been studying uh, this is a very sophisticated structure, um, the five sum, and it seems to be appearing in the fivefold classifications of the orthogonal Schiffer polynomials, which has implications for quantum physics and for probability and statistics. But there's a sixth thing that can happen, you know, which would be the Kravchuk polynomials. If you do a very special tweak, you see, it turns out that uh, if, if, you know, you have these parameters, uh, steps alpha and beta, and then this other parameter is counting the number cycles, step gamma. 
And under the condition where like gamma divided by alpha times beta is an integer, not just any old real number, but an integer, then the character of the polynomial changes in a sense. And what happens is that uh, things go to zero. So instead of having a whole infinite sequence of polynomials, um, you know, where you start with first degree, zero of degree is one, then first degree is X, then it might be like X squared and plus something, X cubed plus something. At a certain power of X in the Cropshire polynomials, it just, it will go to zero. Um, you know, you have to kind of, I think you have to kind of specify it, but basically because they're built on uh, the, the, the Meixner like might be related to the bell curve, but you could have a discrete version of the bell curve. Um, actually, it's the other way around. The Meixner is built on a discrete version, but if, if everything works out right, then you go to a continuum. It's very strange. Like the discrete version would keep growing and building, etc. But when you take it to the, if, if the numbers are tweaked in a certain way, like they can't move, then it all smooths out. You can't understand what I'm talking about. It's okay. But the point I'm trying to make is that under these very simple circumstances, you have this, It I think it gives you like a global quanta. So we're used to having tiny quanta, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in physics, uh, the smallest things could be. But the idea is that uh, there should be a global quanta. The largest things could be based on some research ideas I've had with regard to the only dilemma as a knowledge switch, but also this comes up with these Cropshire polynomials. I think the gist is that if things are priceless, you know, if things are, and if you have like an upper, you get the situation where you have this upper limit on what your um, system can be. And with that upper limit, uh, with that quantization of the upper limit, uh, um, the system taps out. And I think that you get this, it's basically saying the system has a sense of morality. And I was explaining uh, in linear regression video, like to John, like uh, if you build a nuclear power plant in Lithuania, you know, you think that's the optimal thing to do. The idea is that it could be optimal in a country like Canada or a place like Siberia where you can average over disasters, but see, in Lithuania would be all or nothing. And so if certain things are priceless. You can't do all or nothing calculations with them. Then that's morality things. So there's a kind of like extra, you get an extra level of reflection. Um, so what the point is, is that, um, and maybe the th crucial thing to say, like, to understand why this is an eight cycle, these eight frames of mind and how you move along them. But what happens with logic is you get the, you get the seven perspectives, uh, like the logical square, you know, all are good, all are bad. Uh, there exists a good, there exists a bad. Those are four corners of a square and you can have three sides. You could say like, there exists a good, there exists a bad. But also you can say like, all are good, but there exists a good. All are bad, but there exists a bad. And see, the special thing about that, see, when you say all are good, um, but there may be no good. The system may be empty. See, so when you say all are good, but there are, it, 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 you have that. It's not the same as saying uh, all are good and there exists a good. Is not the same as saying all are good because of that little uh, sophisticated uh, detail. So you can have the seven sum, which is like a complete self-standing logical system where you have this slack, and uh, slack is extremely important. Um, but then if you added an eighth perspective, you would add all are good and all are bad. But like if all are good and all are bad, and those are opposites, you see, then the whole system must be empty. But if the whole system is empty, then none of these possibilities make sense. You know, So then the whole thing just crashes and you have, uh, um, it, it just becomes the null sum, so to speak, it just goes away. So that 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 was what I kind of noticed that made me happy. It's, you know, a lot of this is aesthetic. Uh, what what do I want, right? In my picture of the world, uh, uh, but that's very happy in terms of knowledge of everything because if you have that collapse, it means that you can um, have a potential of knowing everything. Otherwise, just going to grows, 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 and uh, my mind can't help. Like in eight is basically the limit. Like the mind can introspect uh, six. You know, the building blocks we work with are the two, some three, some four, some. If you push it to the limit, like maybe with issues of morality, you know, you can handle six perspectives. But in order to have seven perspectives, you're pushing beyond that. So if you reflect and, and add an extra perspective, uh, but, you know, that would be you reflecting, you could reflect on six. But then after that, like you just, the just whole thing collapses. Uh, so you can, but you have this eightfold structure, nevertheless, that you can um, 
uh, think about and and, and uh, study and model and so and so in mathematics there's a fantastic thing called bot periodicity, which has that uh, nature of this eight cycle periodicity, uh, but also relates to uh, things like you know when you classify topological insulators in quantum physics, um, and there's a twofold periodicity and eightfold periodicity, so there's a tenfold classification of these materials. But they have these very similar metaphysical questions like being or becoming. So like if time is in some materials, you can see that uh, time, it acts as if time was reversible. You can go in either direction. It's all the same. But in other materials, you get that time is irreversible. But see, like if time is re irreversible, that means things can happen. Things can become. But if time is uh, reversible, there's no becoming. It's all it's all the same. So, or for example, uh, the notion of being, like uh, in some materials, when you have an antiparticle, it's the same as having a hole in a particle C. Um, but in other cases, it's not the same as having a hole in the particle C. So when you talk about things being, right, and not being, like if if things are, that means. Uh, there's more, I think that means that there's more than them simply being not there, right? That there's a positive element to them being there. It's more than just a hole, right? It actually, uh, it behaves differently than just a hole. That was what we would call being. Uh, at least that's one version. But you can see these questions are coming up in uh, topological installators. Uh, just the whole notion of bot periodicity has to do with perspectives. These are frameworks of perspectives. If you think of like how a sphere maps onto a sphere, let's say it seems related to perspectives. Uh, so uh, the thing I need to conclude here in this preliminaries is um, the um, idea of um, shifting. So how does our mind move? So when our mind is in a frame, let's say for decision making, that means we have five different perspectives, like every effect has had its cause, not all the, not, not every cause has had its effects, there's a decision point for deciding. Um, and that can arise, let's say, by reflecting on another issue. Like, you know, we're absorbed in some issue, but like then we can reflect on it. So if you reflect once, it would be a um, one perspective. But if you reflect twice, it'd be like a perspective on a perspective. And then the max is reflecting three times. It's a perspective on a perspective on a perspective. And uh, we are familiar. And so that moves you through. So like uh, if you may think about like opposites coexisting and everything being the same, like you may think about existence, let's say. But if you are conscious of it, then you're actually uh, in, in decision making. You've kind of moved over. Um, and so, just to give a little bit of intuition, like of how to, un I understand these uh, plus one, plus two, plus three. You can think of us as having, like, you can think of our person as basically being uh, three threads that are in a rope, right? But um, so the first thread would be like this, uh, I call it the unconscious. So it'd be the first reflection, but it's like the Google mind. So there's part of us, like you, you ask yourself a question, right? And it knows the answer like right away, like what's your favorite ice cream? And it'll give you one answer, right? And it'll be the sum of all the knowledge that you have in your body, let's say pistachio, right? That's my favorite ice cream. So, um, but there's another like where, oh, so that's like what I know, right? But there's another way to approach things, which is in terms of what I don't know, like asking questions, okay? So there's a part of our mind, uh, which is, I call it, let's say, the conscious mind or is awareness, which is modeling like what we don't know and is able to kind of like engage the unconscious by asking questions. So I think of it like as a little girl riding a huge elephant, you know, the huge elephant is so powerful, this, this uh, unconscious, right? But the little girl asks a question, like, you know, and so the little girl can ask a question that requires two answers or six answers or five answers, you see. And that way it starts to control and, you know, ride the elephant. So they work together. And um, in fact, the logical uh, square I was talking about, you see, has beautiful duality in it, like where the knowledge uh, that knows and the knowledge uh, of what is not known, you know, they kind of complement each other beautifully. That's basically why I understand this to have two hemispheres. It's not because, you know, if this is science. Science says that, you know, a fish got hit on one side, but the other side kept going. <laughs> it's a ridiculous reason. Like, why do we have 
hemispheres, right? No, the reason is, is that it's a design requirement. The design requirement says you need two minds. You need a mind that is built on knowing, and you need a mind that's built on not knowing. You need an answering mind. You need a questioning mind. They need to work together, see? And also, again, like, that's not something that's hardwired into us. That's something that is simply the way things have to work. So the software will uh, do that. But the idea is that the hardware in the brain is plastic and it can change all the time. But the idea is that because in general, there's this issue, the hardware reflects the software issue, the software requirements. But the software can, you know, if, if you're, the software can do things in other ways. And that's an example of something like where neuroscience is just not going to find based on the hardware. You have to understand the system requirements. So this is a study of the human system requirements. Uh, and, you know, the interpretations can be made of it. So now, uh, so we have one mind that kind of is dealing in terms of what is, and one mind is dealing in terms of what's not, like the rational mind, right? The, the irrational mind. But um, there's a third mind that's like the controller that decides which one to give preference to. And that is what I call consciousness, okay? So consciousness decides who to listen to. Are you going to listen to your instincts, right? Uh, eat the ice cream, right? Or are you going to listen to uh, the other instincts? Is that wait, you know, till after dinner or whatever? But the point being that uh, uh, the, con the con consciousness is developed in a system where actually, like, you know, your instincts can be very good because, you know, the instincts have been trained to work with the um, rational mind. And so... The rational mind can make mistakes. The instincts can can you know help you save. I really don't know if I should say, but like when you look at the genders, for example. So like I've very hard like to be gendered. Like that's the kind of thing that's completely not relevant, you know, for abstract, you know. But uh, it actually is. I think it's fair to say like it does creep in exactly here. Like in a society, we need uh, someone to be the champion for the unconscious point of view, and we need someone to be the champion for the uh, rational point of view. And you can decide what sexes they are. But I think like people kind of know, and I've talked across culture, and I've actually found that uh, uh, the people in the opposite sex of me, you know, don't seem don't seem troubled by that at all, that that seems actually a helpful way maybe to think about it, you know. So the point being, though, that uh, it's not like a fixed, you know, it's just there's even biological reasons like, you know, why? But they're not really, I mean, basically it's like absolutely not, um, it's not important like who does which and both people can do which. And so, but it says that like, it's important for dialogue, especially if we want dialogue that's so crucial in our time, like dialogue that is not uh, just as Judea Pearl says, interventionist, right? But dialogue that could be counterfactual. <laughs> and I could say, hey, what if we did something else, right? Uh, and you can see how rational thinking is abused. Rational thinking is supposed to help us ask, well, what if we did that? You see? But rational thinking is being abused, saying, no, 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 we can't do anything, but let's say supply more arms. And it's not like you can't, um, of course, you can not You can do two things. Okay, let's supply more arms, but also like let's reach out to the enemy, right? And try to think about, listen to them, like, well, what is on their minds, you know? So this was all the long preliminaries. But, you know, uh, and, and just a very um, quick uh, version of it, um, I'll be uploading at some point a paper that I've, uh, a talk that I've given about this. And um, uh, so this is kind of like what is basic knowledge for future like research updates. Uh, what do you what, would want to learn in order to engage me? And my hope is uh, a year from now uh, that I could be doing the, maybe enough people have kind of like contemplated these things and seen how they connect in math, et cetera, then we could be working on things like this together. Certainly could happen earlier, uh, but I've, I've told you a lot. Wow, I checked my clock. <laughs> it was a long time talking about the preliminaries. So I don't want to make a nine hour video. Um, this will be a separate video. Thank you for watching. Uh, I'll uh, have a series of, of these um, videos continuing with the overview of the big picture. And uh, this is Andrus Kolikowskas, Math for Wisdom. Please like this video, subscribe to this vid uh, video series, uh, and support me through Patreon. Be well, and I pray to God to hope that something could connect with you that we could understand and work together. This would be, that's why we, that's why I do this. Good night. <laughs>